Well, there's a common question. Where are you going? You know, you get acquainted with someone, strike up a conversation with someone at the airport, and pretty soon someone says, well, where are you going? Or maybe you stop at the oasis on the tollway somewhere and get a visiting with someone else, and they'll probably say, where are you going? Well, that's a good question. Where are you going? And we come to the end of a year now and look back over the year and uh, look back and see what's happened. And then we look ahead and might well ask ourselves, where are we going? Now, this has been an interesting year here in this church. It's been filled with blessings. We've seen, seen considerable growth in attendance, improvement in our finances, a lot of improvements in the building, equipment, and facilities and added the Askins to our staff. That's been a blessing. And uh, so there have been many blessings. New members added to the congregation. And there have been some hard things as well. Many people have had health problems this past year. And uh, several longtime members have gone to be with the Lord, not with us anymore. And certainly we miss that. But we should be now looking forward to the coming year. And uh, primarily asking ourselves, where are we going spiritually? What progress are you going to make spiritually in the coming year? And that's what matters. Not how much money do you make next year. Not uh, how many numbers will we have next year, but what spiritual progress are we going to make in our lives during this next year? And so I'd like to give you several suggestions for spiritual growth and progress. If you'll give heed this morning, I turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And in Philippians chapter 3, direct your attention to verses 12 through verse 15. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul says, Not as though I had already attained, Neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Well, in those few little verses, there are two basic suggestions for progress. What does it take to make spiritual progress and spiritual growth in our life? First of all, it takes a humble attitude. And then it takes a consistent effort, a conscious effort, a deliberate effort. So consider that with me. First of all, if we are to make progress, we need to have a humble attitude, as Paul did. Now, Paul was a great man. Uh, he was a successful Christian. He accomplished much. He was changing the world, and he was still humble. And notice... His humility, first of all, he had a recognition of his imperfections. Recognition of his imperfections. In verse 12, he says, not as though I had already attained. I don't have it made yet. Neither were already perfect. I haven't arrived at perfection, Paul says. He had an honest, humble account of himself. And he realized that he had not arrived. Uh, he still had to fight a battle with sin. He said, sometimes the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I shouldn't do, I do. He had a struggle with sin. Uh, he was still trying to become more like Jesus Christ. He wanted to preach the gospel to more people. There was much for Paul to do yet, much for him to accomplish. And he was not resting on his laurels. He wasn't saying, well, I'm good enough. I've done more than most people, so what do I need to worry about accomplishing something and progressing anymore? No, that wasn't Paul's attitude. He wasn't satisfied with himself. 
He humbly admitted he had not attained and achieved all he should have. And if Paul had not arrived, then certainly you and I haven't arrived either. And I hope you are not satisfied with yourself as you are. And don't compare yourself with others and say, oh, I'm as good as that person or those people or that fellow over there. That's not the model. That's not the standard. The standard is Jesus Christ, not your neighbor, not your friend. And we need to humbly assess our own situation, our own spiritual condition. You see, we all still have many sins to defeat. We still have many goals to reach. We have much ground to be gained. We have many uh, victories yet to win. We have many uh, weaknesses to improve. There are things in your life and your heart and mind that need to be dealt with and done. Changes that need to be made. Progress that needs to take place. Victories that need to be accomplished. And I might ask you, before you look ahead, look back on the last year. How much progress did you make? How much spiritual progress? Uh, and then ask, what can I do more in the next year? You see too many people, too many Christians are just kind of sliding along on the road to nowhere. But that's what it shouldn't be. Recognize your imperfections, analyze your sins, criticize your failings, so you can go on. But you can't go on until you are honest and dissatisfied with your present condition, and that takes a humble attitude. Recognition that we still have a long ways to go. And unless you humbly admit to yourself and to God that you haven't arrived, that you have a long way to go, until you come to that place, you'll never make any progress. And I'm sure there's probably folks sitting here this morning, you're satisfied with where you are. Oh, but that's not where we ought to be. We always ought to go on to maturity. <clears throat> so if Paul was to make progress, he needed that humble attitude. And secondly, it takes a conscious effort. Notice what he says, three things. He says in verse 13, I have to be forgetting. And secondly, I have to be reaching. And in verse 14, I have to be pressing. Forgetting the things behind, reaching forth to those before, pressing toward the mark. And let's look at those things a little bit with me, if you would. First of all, if we're going to make any effort, make any headway, we need to be forgetting those things which are behind. That's what it says, verse 13. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, there are some things we shouldn't forget. You don't forget everything. But there are some things we should remember. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, I'll refer to that verse, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 11, a good verse to take heed to, where Israel was coming to the edge of the promised land, and Moses was giving them some warnings and exhortations for God. And God, through Moses, said in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Don't forget to obey the word of God. Don't forget to obey God and obey God's commandments. Well, that's nothing we should forget. The Old Testament Israelites were told to talk about them when they sat in their house and when they walked by the way. They should write them on their wall and over their door. They should teach them to their children so they wouldn't forget to obey the Lord. And do we take time to ask ourselves, are we really living the way God says we should? Are we really obeying God? Are we all? following his commandments, as you get involved doing something, do you ever stop and ask yourself, is this really the right thing? Am I doing it right? Well, don't forget his commandments. And don't forget his promises. 
Oh, we have so many wonderful promises in the word of God. Peter says, unto us are giving exceeding great promises. Precious promises. How we need to keep in mind the promises of God. Read the promises of God. Memorize the promises of God. Think about the promises of God. The promises to care for you. The promises to guide you. The promises to keep you. The promises to answer prayer. The promises to forgive. All of God's promises. Multitudes of them. And you keep the promises of God in mind and think about them. And that will keep you from being discouraged. That will help you to overcome trials. Oh, don't forget the promises of God. Kind of like when the snow comes, you know, like lately. What do you do? Well, the snow is coming. Better go to the closet and drag out the boots and find the shovel and get the heavy mittens out in the parka and get ready for it because the snow is coming. And when troubles and trials come in your life, you need to go to your spiritual closet and drag out the promises of God. And they'll get you through those times. Don't forget his promises. And then there's something else we shouldn't forget, and that is don't forget about the victories. Don't forget the victories. Israel came to the edge of the promised land, and they had a big challenge ahead of them. There were all those mean people in there they were going to have to contend with. They had big cities and walls around them, and, and great big giants of men they were going to have to fight with, and they had real sharp swords and, and uh, sharp pointed arrows. And uh, they were going to have to battle those people. And Joshua said, now, don't get upset. What I want you to do is remember. Remember when God delivered you from Egypt. Remember how God worked for you and gave you that great victory. And Pharaoh and all his armies were drowned in the sea. Don't forget that. And then you just remember to trust God for victories ahead. Because if God got you through, gave you victories in the past, he will do it again in the future. And this coming year, you can mark it down, you are going to have problems. I don't know what problems, how many, how big, how small, but you will have problems guaranteed. That's part of life. That's the way it is. And you will have trials, and you will have temptations, and you will have testings. And when you do, remember how God has answered prayer. Remember the victories of the past. Remember how God has helped you through difficult times before. And that same God can give you victories in the future as well. And something else we ought to remember is remember what the Lord has done. Go back to Psalm 77 for a moment. 77th Psalm. Psalm 77. Verses 7 and 8. David is discouraged. He's having a hard time. Things aren't going well. And he says, verse 7, Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean, gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten me? Is God not helping me anymore? Has God gone on vacation? Uh, I'm having all these troubles. What can I do about it? Well, how did he encourage himself? Go down to verse 11. He says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Oh, I'll just remember how God has helped me before. How before God has answered prayer. How God has helped me through trials before. How God has helped me through difficulties before. And you remember those things. You go back and take inventory of your life and see the many times, the many ways God has helped you. And how that will be an encouragement to you in those times. God has done so much for you in the past and for me. Certainly he will be help in the future. Remember the disciples that time they got halfway across the Sea of Galilee and they realized they'd forgotten to bring lunch along. Now you get 12 hungry men and no lunch, you got a problem. And they said, oh, we've got a problem. We forgot to bring any bread. 
And Jesus said, why are you concerned about bread? Don't you remember? How much did we have left over when we fed the 5,000 people? Oh, yeah. How much did we have uh, left over when we fed 4,000 people with a couple biscuits and a few little fish? Oh, yeah, we had lots left over. All right, then. If God can provide then, God can provide now, God can provide tomorrow as well. Our God who's done so much in the past certainly will do the same in your life and he's able to take care of things in the future. So, things we shouldn't forget. Don't forget the Lord. Don't forget his promises, his help, his blessings, his victories. Don't forget those things. But there are some things that we should forget. Paul said, I'm forgetting those things that are past. There are some things that Paul, I'm sure, wanted to forget. Maybe sometimes they came to his mind and he said, oh, I wish that had never happened. I'm sure sometimes he remembered about the Christians he had persecuted. When he went about from place to place, torturing them, compelling them to blaspheme, uh, hailing them into prison, and having them beaten. Oh, he didn't like to remember that. And how he supervised the stoning of Stephen. There he was in charge of things as those uh, wicked and angry Jews stoned Stephen to death. And Paul was giving his consent. Oh, how he didn't like to think about that. And there was Paul's pride in his religious good works. Oh, I'm a... Pharisee, the Pharisees, the tribe of Benjamin, keeping the law, observing all these ceremonies. Oh, how he was so proud of his religious heritage and his religious conduct until he realized that was all uh, just nothing but garbage in God's sight. And oh, how he thought back about his religious pride and wanted to forget that. Maybe his disagreement with Barnabas, time he and Barnabas, good companions, fellow workers for the Lord, had that bit, big disagreement about whether Mark should go along with them. So they parted company, and I'm sure Paul didn't relish thinking about that. Uh, something went wrong there he wished hadn't happened. And the, the people who deserted him, from time to time, you know, Paul didn't have 100% success. He had many people various times who would turn against him and desert him. Demas left him and, and uh, turned away and others as well. And, uh, oh, there were so many things. Paul could look back and say, oh, that shouldn't have been. There was a mistake I made. I did that wrong. I should have done that differently. But, he says, I've got to forget those things. Can't go through the rest of my life feeling guilty about those things. Can't go back and change them. Better forget them. And you could let things from the past bog you down as well. Mistakes you made, things you've done, past life, things you weren't happy with, and you could let those things bog you down. But forget them. Don't let failures of the past hinder you from victories in the future. Forget those things. Things to be forgotten. Secondly, Paul says, I'm forgetting some things and I'm reaching for some things. Look at chapter 3, verse 13 again. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Those things ahead of me, reaching for those. That word reaching, stretching out your hand, trying to grasp something that's just almost out of your reach like a runner in a race and he's nearing the finish line and he's just doing all he can to stretch out and hit that tape ahead of someone else. And that suggests desire. There's something I want, I'm reaching for it, I'm after it, I'm trying to get it. Desiring it. Trying to get the strength to attain it. Now do you have that in your spiritual life? Are there things in your spiritual life you're striving for? reaching for, grasping for, wanting to attain? Well, if you do, that's great. And if you don't, that's not so good. You know, the greatest enemy to spiritual progress is satisfaction. 
being satisfied with where we are. And too many Christians are getting nowhere because they're satisfied with where they are. After all, I'm going to heaven. I get answers to prayer once in a while, not too often, but once in a while, you know. And uh, I, I get along with people and go to church and have a good time and enjoy all the snacks and things and, and even get to prayer meeting once in a while and sing the choir. So what more does God want of me anyway? Why, we've got a maid. Well, when we feel that way, we're saying, I'm satisfied with my spiritual progress. Or you could say it this way, I am satisfied with spiritual kindergarten. Now, does a kindergartner want to go on to first grade? Well, maybe not. I mean, when you're in kindergarten, man, you get snacks and treats all the time. You get to take a nap in the afternoon, and you just play games and cut things out and stick things on papers. Why would anybody want to leave that and go on to first grade? You get to first grade, you don't get naps anymore, and you got to do all this schoolwork, and you get homework, and man, let's just stay in kindergarten. Somebody would like to be back in kindergarten now. Uh, that's the easy way. So why should we want to go on? Well, there's reasons for going on. But too often we're in spiritual kindergarten and we're satisfied with staying there. You know, we're getting along, we're having a good time, and uh, we're just enjoying it. Why should we want to change anything? Well, we should never be satisfied with our spiritual progress. We've never gone so far that there's not further to go. Remember Caleb, back there in the Old Testament, he wasn't satisfied. They divided up the land and they gave Caleb his chunk of land. He says, well, that's good, but I want that mountain. I want some more. Jacob, God blessed him in many ways. Gave him large herds and flocks and all those things, family, children. He had all those things. That wasn't enough. When he was wrestling that with that angel, he said, I won't let you go unless you bless me more. Bless me more. Moses had seen some glorious things. He saw God dividing the waters of the Red Sea. He saw the enemies washing up on the shore, drowned, defeated. He'd seen uh, visions of God on Mount Sinai. He'd received the tables of the, of the law from God himself. Was he satisfied with that? He says, no, Lord, I, I want some more. Show me your glory. He wanted more. Elisha. He'd been with Elijah. He'd seen the miracles that Elijah had done, raising the dead, and feeding the crowds, and all those things. He'd seen those. And when it was time for Elijah to be taken to heaven, he says, what do you want, Elisha? He said, I want twice what you had. I want twice of the blessings of power of God that you had. He wanted more. And that's the way we ought to be. It doesn't matter how far you've gotten spiritually. You haven't arrived. None of us have, and we need to want more. You see, satisfied soldiers don't win battles. And satisfied athletes don't win ball games. And satisfied businessmen don't make any money. And satisfied Christians don't gain any blessings. Paul says, I'm reaching for better things. More progress. More blessings from God. And let me encourage you to make that your position this year. Don't be satisfied with where you are. Say, this year I'm going to go forward. Go on and grow. Learn. Have more blessings. Then the third thing Paul said, I am forgetting things behind, reaching forth unto things before, and pressing toward the mark. There in verse 13, uh, verse 14, I press toward the mark. He was pushing himself, pressing means pushing, exerting himself, pursuing. Like a racer, putting forth that extra effort and exerting every muscle and directing all his attention on that goal to obtain the prize. Obtain the prize. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. You know, there is a prize for the believer. 
There is a judgment day when Christ will say to some, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Christ will say, thou hast been faithful in a few things, I will set you over many things. Christ will say, oh, you've gained 10 pounds, I'll give you another 10 pounds of talents. Oh, you've done a good job, I'll put you in charge of 10 cities. Oh, yes, there is a prize to be one. And we cannot imagine the nature and the extent of the heavenly awards, but there will be a prize. So strive that ye may obtain. You don't coast to the finish line. You don't float to the victor's circle. Spiritually, it's only by reaching and pressing that you can obtain the blessing that God wants you to have. Now let me go back for just a moment to that matter of forgetting. Forgetting those things which are behind and just point out some practical suggestions of things that we should forget. Because many Christians live in defeat because they don't know what to forget. First of all, we ought to forget the past sins. Oh, it's easy to get discouraged, think back over your life, and oh, I made a mistake there, I messed up there, I did that wrong, I did this wrong, and so on. That's an awful thing that I did. But remember what 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our faults, he is faithful and just, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those things, those sins of the past, no, we don't want to repeat them, but forget them. You can't go back and undo them, so it does no good to dwell on them except the forgiveness of God. David sinned. He did some awful things. Adultery and murder. But that wasn't the end. He confessed his sin to God and God cleansed him of his sin and he went on to live for God and experience God's blessings and accomplish much for God. Maybe in your life, you got some sins of the past been bugging you and bothering you and you need to learn to accept God's forgiveness and forget those things. Secondly, I suggest you forget past failures. Oh, maybe you tried to do something and you failed. I know folk who tried to break a habit. Oh, that's a sinful habit. I tried and I tried and I tried and I've given up on trying. I just can't make it. Maybe you tried to teach a Sunday school class and you failed. Maybe you tried to witness to somebody and they laughed at you. So forget your failures. Remember Elijah's servant. God has said to Elijah, there's going to be no rain for three and a half years, but according to your word. And finally, the three and a half years were over. And Elijah brought the prophets of Baal up there. Remember, they had that great contest. And the prophets of the wicked prophets of Baal were slain. And Elijah said, now I'm going to pray for rain. And he got on the edge of Mount Carmel up there overlooking the sea, got down on his knees and started to pray. And he said to his servant, go look and see. Any weather coming? He went, came back, says, nothing. Sun shining. Brightest day as ever. And he prayed again. He says, go look again. He went, looked, came back, nothing. No, nothing but sunshine out there. And over and over and over again, he went six times he went, and each time he came back, and there was nothing there. And Elijah says, go look again. And the seventh time, he said, there's a little cloud out there. Amen. Size of a man's fist. And Elijah said, tell Ahab to get his chariot going because there's going to be rain. Amen. But you see, just because you fail once or again and again, why that servant was probably about to give up six times and nothing. Why don't you forget it, Elijah? This isn't working. Try something else. No. He forgot about the failures. Went on. We read about Abraham Lincoln. So many things he failed at. Business failed. He failed in election after election after election over and over and over again. Failed, failed, lost, 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 failed. And then was elected president of the United States, one of our greatest presidents. Told Edison, 
trying to develop a light bulb so we could have lights to see with. And he experimented, experimented, hundreds of experiments. And every time he did one and it didn't work, he said, well, now we know one other thing that won't work. And he kept on. But see, that's the way we have to live this Christian life. Just because you fail, just because you mess up, just because something doesn't go right, you don't give up and quit. You keep on. Forget about the past failures. And then on the other side, we should forget about past victories. You know, some Christians are living today on the victories of 10 years ago. Oh, 10 years ago, I taught a vacation Bible school class, and it was great. There were a couple of kids saved that week. That was wonderful. 10 years ago. Five years ago, I, I defeated a bad habit I had. That was great. And seven years ago, I brought somebody to church with me. Well, yeah, that's great. But what about now? Oh, well, not doing anything now. Nothing's happening now. But I had some great times back there in the past. Well... Tell me what you're doing now. The victories of the past mean nothing if we're not gaining victories today. Remember, think of Joshua entering into the promised land and they went in, they fought a battle, won a great victory, and they fought another battle and gained a great victory. And then supposing Joshua had said to his soldiers, well, my, we've certainly done well. We've got two great victories. Uh, let's just sit down and think about this a little bit. We're going to pass out some medals. Maybe we'll uh, look at some uh, video clips of the, uh, the fight and see where we could do better. And we'll talk about that. We'll take some time off now because, after all, we won two great victories. Well, if they were doing that, the enemy would have been regrouping their forces and attacked them. They'd been right back where they started from. No, you can't live on past victories. You have to keep going forward and gaining new ground and winning, fighting new battles and winning new victories. Don't let the victories of the past keep you from accomplishing something now. And the fourth suggestion, something else to forget. Forget bitterness. Oh, it's so easy to get dwelling on something bad that happened. Oh, the way that person treated me or this awful thing that happened or they said those nasty things to me. And... Uh, Remember Saul, that one little incident when David defeated Goliath and the women were singing just to probably kind of silly songs. Oh, Saul's defeated his thousands and David his ten thousands and that stuck in Saul's craw and all oh, that bothered him. And he dwelt on that and he thought about that and the more he thought about it, I've got to get rid of that David, I've got to get even, I've got to straighten this out. And he imagined worse and worse things, and it affected his mind and ruined his usefulness and led him to eventual defeat and suicide because of bitterness. Oh, bitterness eats like a cancer. It'll go on and destroy you if you allow it. And if you look and see if you have some bitterness in your heart about something that happened, something somebody said, and you still think about it and you're still upset about it, oh, you need to learn to forget it. Paul says, let all bitterness be put away from you with all malice. Forget it. Put it behind you. Quit dwelling on it before it destroys you. Paul said, put it away. And I suppose there's probably some here. Maybe you've got a grudge toward somebody, bitterness toward someone or something in your heart. Oh, don't let that defeat you. Forget it. And then we can forget past sorrows. Past sorrows. Oh, David had his sorrows. Things went wrong. Friends deserted him. People falsely accused him. His baby died. And his own son turned against him. And many nights of tears were his. But he said, uh, he said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. He will yet be the help of your countenance. And maybe you have faced some sorrows in your life, heartaches, tears. The Lord understands. The Lord grieves with you. But the time comes when you have to put those things behind you and go on. 
And then something else to forget. Forget your brother's sins. That other person, maybe they sinned against you or did something bad, something, maybe your hero failed or the one you loved fell or some Christian friend messed up. Oh, that bothers you, discourages you. Remember when the disciples came to Jesus and said, you know, what shall I do with this guy? He sinned against me and then he comes and wants me to forgive him. How many times do I have to do that? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, not seven times, 70 times seven. In other words, just keep on forgiving that other person. Oh, don't let the sins of the other person discourage you and hinder you from going forward to God. Well, what are you looking for in this coming year? Are you going to just coast along spiritually and hope nothing bad happens? Or are you going to strive for some spiritual progress? Strive for some spiritual growth. Uh, do you have some sins to defeat and some lessons to learn and some unsaved folk to win and others to help and prayers to get answered? Oh, let's have some spiritual goals and try to accomplish something and go forward. Don't be satisfied with where you are. Forget those things which are behind. Reach forth for spiritual progress and press on until you gain the victory. Let's pray.